presenting our sustainable front runners who are already making it real when it comes to digital product passports. So to kick us off, I'm thrilled to introduce as our first speaker, Julie Brown, Head of Sustainability Neon. Hi, Julie. Hello, Alex, thank you. Hi, Julie, fab. Great to have you with us. Um, so founded in 2015, Eon is a software company with the mission to bridge the gap between the digital and physical world by connecting every item to a digital ID to make it interactive, intelligent and circular. In doing so, Eon hopes to push simple products to becoming intelligent assets that unlock circular business models. In partnership with industry leaders, uh, Eon developed the Circular Product Data Protocol, so the global language for products in the circular economy, which Julie will be telling us more about. Um, it's currently focused on the textiles and apparel sector, one of the priority uh, value chains, of course, in the European Commission's Circular Economy Action Plan, though this solution will be applied to other industries as well. So really looking forward to hearing more about this, Julie. Over to you. Excellent, thank you. Share my screen here. All right, uh, so thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be see such participation today. Um, like Alex said, my name is Julie Brown, Head of Sustainability of Eon Product. And my goal today is to talk to you about how Eon enables a digital product passport and its approach to this and lessons learned and best practices for enabling transparency and traceability and circularity of products throughout the value chain. Um, I'm used to saying the term digital ID for this, the purposes of this presentation, I'm using that synonymously with digital product passport. So if I say one, it, it means the other two. So Eon is a cloud-based digital product passport company that aims to turn products into assets by making by communicating the right information to the right people at the right time. So today, when you purchase a product, it usually comes with a hang tag and that might have a little bit of information about the product and a barcode that which would have more data behind it. But as soon as you buy it, that that hang tag is cut off, right? And all of the data behind it is gone and all of the connectivity that the seller has to that product is also gone. With the digital product passport, a data carrier is permanently affixed to a product, uh, and this could be in the form of a QR code, an NFC chip, an RFID, even something you know more innovative like the, the uh, digital fingerprint. And when value chain stakeholders scan that hardware, they can see and exchange data that's relevant to them and that they have special permissions to access. Right now, Eon is focusing on the uh, fashion industry, but this is, the solution is definitely applicable to other industries as well. Here are some of the things, themes I'm going to dive into today. Uh, Eon's working with a variety of brands, large and small, some of which you can see on the screen. And it offers a network of value chain partners for data exchange, including resellers, recyclers, and a variety of different applications. Eon developed the circular product data protocol defining data to be associated with a product for circular business. And it enables an end-to-end -end product passport, providing visibility into the root of a product post point of sale, aligning with some of the objectives of upcoming legislation. So digging into each of these a little bit more, um, in partnership with the Sustainable Markets Initiative Fashion Task Force, Eon is the technology partner to luxury brands committed to digitizing all products by 2025. So it's become very clear that companies are really hopping on board with the idea of a digital product passport. They're seeing the value of this and they're making big commitments that will be happening quickly. I want to dig into data um, early on here because I know it's such a big topic. And so I mentioned the circular product data protocol a couple times. And that defines the specific data needs for a product to be stewarded into circular business models. And it was created with various stakeholders who you can see here um, using the ICL code 
a process for setting standards. And the protocol doesn't define just what the data should be, but also defines the intended audience, the priority level, and even the data description and structure and formatting as well. And that's to make sure that there's interoperability within different systems. Um, so for example, today resellers often don't have the data that they need to efficiently resell a product. Uh, sometimes they end up just getting a product and Googling what it could be and trying to find some information to adequately value it and then resell it. But what they need is a simple way to access all the data that's important to them. So this could be something like the name of the product, the original sale price, the season, um, anything that can help them market that product and value it properly. So that can really increase some efficiencies. And But if you're a recycling partner, you're going to need completely different kinds of data. You're going to need material content, any dyes or finishes or pigment that could contaminate a batch. And so uh, you're going to need a different level of data, and all of that is defined in this protocol. And it includes what's considered to be the most essential data for circular business models. So it could be a huge breadth of, of data points and options that could um, they'll be looking at new technologies and everything, but what it's focused on is adoptability today. What could be scaled today with large and small companies? Because it's critical um, that all companies are able to do this. And it's also, to that point, a flexible solution. So data could be coming from a brand. It could be coming from their value chain partners. It could be uploaded manually through Excel, or it could be automated into the system as well. Um, and you can build up depending on your use case and uh, where you are with your data collection point too. Today, the uh, protocol is independently governed to make sure that it is um, that it remains relevant and accurate over time as the circularity landscape changes. It's changing very fast. Um, so we want to make sure that it, it stays up to date. And you can actually all download it at circulardataprotocol.org. It's a publicly available free document. And that's for the purpose of adoption. We want to make sure that other technology companies can leverage it, that it can be used as a resource for policy conversations as well, because um, that interoperability, again, will be key to that scale. So providing the data for each product is one thing, but communicating it to the right partners is another, and another critical piece. So companies throughout the value chain can integrate with one another's APIs, making it easy to connect to an ecosystem of apps and partners and platforms. And this takes products from where we are today with you know, the hang tag and then getting rid of it to a smart product where you might have a product that connects to one experience. Like this could be you know, a menu at a restaurant, for example, where you scan the QR code um, to a connected product where uh, a product is able to connect to uh, many different organizations, users, applications, and capabilities. So I'll go into what of those capabilities and, and applications can be. Um, the first one is customer experience. So engaging consumers. Consumers want to know information behind their products. And once they have this information, it can start to build that trust and loyalty with companies. And through digital ID, you could increase transparency of product information, such as sustainability information in this case, where you could include measurements, stories, targets, um, manufacturing information, care and repair information. And you can direct, you can connect directly with the consumer, gain insights about what engages them most, and continue to offer services for that product throughout the entire life cycle of the product. And this transparency can be taken further by including certifications or alignments with different standards. So companies can manage data for digital product passports according to different standards and display current certifications or different requirements for those standards for a product. And when a product is connected, digital IDs can be populated with verified information directly from external partners via an API for internal or external use. So for example, this is an important point for verification because rather than getting all of the data from from one place or from the brand that you work with we're connecting directly with the third party stakeholder that is responsible for that data so it's getting it directly from the source 
to pull it into that digital ID. Companies, um, particularly in fashion, know that e-commerce is booming and it will be for the next few years. And that consumer interest in buying pre-loved or secondhand products is increasing dramatically. But the programs don't typically scale and don't typically tend to make much profit, if any. And there are two big barriers causing this. And one is data availability, not knowing what the product is and inefficiency and in, in understanding that. And so that was, we've been over the data, but the second one is also ease of stewarding consumers through to the, the circular economy models. I've been, I was talked to someone recently who was trying to resell something and they were filling out the form and they said, you know, it, once I figured out how to do it and then was filling out all the data, I just gave up. It's not easy to do and it's not convenient. But with digital ID, you can seamlessly populate listings to resell items through a preferred channel. And this allows brands to generate more revenue from a single physical good across its entire life cycle. And these products can also be authenticated through a variety of uh, solutions like NFC or virtual fingerprint, which is also important to the consumer. And an important component of digital product passports is traceability. Um, every product in the uh, EM platform is serialized. So there may be millions of this of a product with the same data set, because it's the same SKU, but each one of those has its own code. And this allows for the tracking uh, visibility into that product post point of sale. And so this doesn't happen today. And today those companies lose visibility into products once it's sold. But with DPPs, value chain partners are logging events data, such as this product was sold, it was repaired, it was resold, it was recycled. And that brings completely new insights to the brand. And this impacts sustainability measurements. It brings accountability to brands for the success of their business models. And it provides into insights into what ultimately happens to products at an industry level after they're sold. And if you pair this post-consumer events with supply chain, chain traceability information collected through a traceability partner, then you can achieve complete end-to-end -end traceability for a product. I noticed there were some specific questions about digital care labels. Um, so I wanted to briefly address this. Um, care instructions could certainly be a part of DPPs rather than relying on physical labels. This is currently a policy discussion in the US um, and digital care lab labels can be embedded in items, ensuring that products information remains connected to the item for its life cycle. And it can also be enriched with other information like the products quality or repair instructions or end of life options. And speaking of policy, this is true for, for any sustainability related policy when it comes to transparency. So uh, if you're required to communicate certain data points in certain regions, the digital product passport can make sure that those data points are within the digital ID and can be communicated to the right people in the right places. So in conclusion here, I want to end with some best practices that we have learned along the way. Um, one is to remain hardware agnostic. Um, there are a lot of different types of hardware emerging and not every product is going to require the same kind of hardware. It's going to need to be a variety. Um, also establishing a network of, of um, to make the right information available. Everyone's going to need to be able to exchange this data. And the data is going to be in, need to live in different places and just have a repository where that communication can take place. Uh, aligning on a shared language. So we have our circular product data protocol, um, but this will need to continue to make sure that the right data is gathered, that it can be consistent, and then it can be interoperable between systems. And the last one is serializing each individual item to enable that end-to-end -end traceability and accountability. All right, and that's all I have. I look forward to answering some questions later. Thank you.